Thank you and good morning. I want to welcome everyone to our educational program today. We are very excited to continue the conversation about fistula management and care in both the acute and the post-acute setting. This presentation is the second part of the fistula management series and our topic this morning is from hopeless to healed 3M comprehensive solutions for fistula patients. Today, we're extremely honored to have Marianne Obst and Kathy Milne, they're true experts in their field. They're joining us today virtually to deliver on this important topic. Marianne Obst is a complex abdomen specialist at Regents Hospital at a level one trauma center and has extensive experience in ICU nursing, in trauma critical care, and in the management of complex abdominal wounds and enterocutaneous fistulas. Kathy Milne, she's an advanced practice wound ostomy incontinence nurse at Connecticut Clinical Nursing Associates in Bristol, Connecticut. And she has extensive experience providing care to patients across the care continuum um, into long-term care, home health, and the outpatient settings as well. Before we begin, I want to invite everyone to be as engaged as you can. We welcome you to submit your questions during the talk. They can be submitted through the chat, and then we will go ahead and address all of your questions at the very end. And just with that, I would just like to turn the floor over to you, Marianne. Good morning. Thank you so much. All right. Um, well, good morning, everyone. I'm super impressed that anyone's awake um, for this lecture on a Sunday morning, so that's fantastic. Um, I am going to kind of start off where I left off yesterday. Um, this is some important information from 3M that I'm going to let you guys read um, at your leisure um, down the road. My disclosures are that I'm, I speak for 3M, which is now a case, um, which KCI is not a part of, and oh, it's morning, and Fistula Solution Corporation, I'm a patent holder. <clears throat> Our objectives um, are big, and so yesterday we discussed a lot about the SNAP, the skin sepsis, nutrition, anatomy, and procedure, acne, ac oh boy, acne. Today we're going to talk about uh, tips and tricks on how to actually manage and contain um, effluent from fistulas, really the nuts and bolts of putting together pouching systems. So Again, yesterday it was related to uh, Professor Carlson and his um, idea of how you can actually make a fistula care pathway using the SNAP acnium. And it really starts with skin and then sepsis, nutrition, anatomy, and procedure. At my facility, we have a dress and change checklist that's part of our electronic medical record. And so how I manage these patients is 60 minutes prior to their dressing change, I notice, notify the surgical team or whatever team is working with the patient. We give them anti-anxiety medication and oral pain medication. Um, and this really helps us to decrease our IV narcotic use for these patients, helps to have them uh, relax a little bit we take away their food and drinks, so the output from their fistula is a little quieter. And then 15 minutes prior to, I put on topical pain medication. When I remove the dressings, I make sure I photograph the back so I can actually have a good record of my failures and my successes and kind of where I can improve on that particular patient's pouching. <clears throat> Supply step is super important for me, <clears throat> sorry. Um, I like to take pictures of it because then uh, I put that in the chart and the nurses, if they need to do a dressing setup without me, they would have it all pictured so they know what to, to prepare for that patient. And so we're going to start with enterocutaneous fistulas. Um, the first technique, so we're going to go through seven techniques. The first one is the landing zone technique with pouch flange sandwich, which is a mouthful. Do you get it? Like a mouthful, you know, sandwich? No. Okay. <laughs> So this is how I actually put my charting into our EPIC electronic medical record. I take pictures of each thing, like this is our setup table. She, this particular patient was showered. I draped the whole wound with uh, gauze and put my lidocaine. I use 4% topical lidocaine. And then while it's uh, kind of giving her some numbing, I cut my pouch and my barrier rings. I like to set my barrier rings just a, a titch back from that juncture between the skin and the wound edge and all the way around. And then I use a small bead of paste all around the inside, kind of like caulking um, for a window. And then also, oh, sorry. 
and then also caulking on the outside of the barrier ring, kind of making that false layer of skin that I can land my, my pouching system on. And then I land the pouching system, but I set it back so it's actually sitting on the barrier rings so I can seal it again with another barrier ring. That's the, the sandwich part of it. And then obviously a little bit of stone paste so that the top of the pouch doesn't stick to the barrier rings because of course they're very sticky. Um, for this pouch, you have to pump up the floating pillow, put it on the uh, top. And this top I have, I've had problems with, so I always uh, tape and seal the edges shut. And then along the edge with these heavy pouches for fistula management, I like to put a clear drape or uh, tape because it, where it, it hits the skin, sometimes like their gown will lift the edges. So here's another example of technique one. And this is just me putting the barrier ring down, sealing the inside, placing the, bar the pouch on the barrier ring itself, sealing it again with the barrier ring, and then another round of paste and powder. Again, landing zone technique. I'm filling in the little crevices like where you can see the uh, blue arrow is, and then sealing it with the paste on the inside and the outside. And I think it's funny, you can see here that our fistula is shooting <laughs> effluent up in the air, which is always so helpful when you're putting on a pouch. Um, and then the barrier, or then the pouch and another barrier ring. I'm running her, we're doing fistulic lysis for this patient, so I'm running her feeding tube through the top of the pouching system, sealing the pouch down. And then this is our high output canister that I'm gonna show you how to make um, at your facility if you want to at the end of this um, presentation. Again, another landing zone, kind of a crinkled up landing zone with lots of wrinkles. We've all had this patient with the ileostomy just downstream. I'm doing the same thing, making that fake layer of skin that's nice, nice and smooth so I can land the poaching system on it. Very denuded skin. When I met this little gal, um, clean the skin as best I can, make sure I really get in all those little wrinkles. I like to put my patients in the shower if um, they're able. And then I'm putting the, the berry ring and paste and powder and then the pouching system again. Technique number two is using negative pressure as a bolster or a mechanical uh, strength for a pouching system. And this particular patient uh, would take her pouch off all the time and it was difficult for us to manage her. And so we actually embedded the, the pouching system into the negative pressure, which is not healing a wound at all. It's just there to bolster the pouch. So intact skin, clean it very nicely, drape it with clear drape, use the negative pressure foam as, as your landing zone and embed the pouching system into it. Some people like to go to a smaller pouch size, especially the folks that are at home and out and about. Um, and so this technique number three is a hybrid dressing to reduce the size. So clearly this man's um, wound is very long and skinny. And so I just, take and put a long standing dressing, this is a silver dressing with the barrier rings, and then I exclude it from the, the fistula effluent area. So that, and then I put a big uh, piece of hydrocolloid over the top, and then the pouching system itself. So it's much smaller than it would need to be if I was gonna try and close the entire thing. And again, this, little, this gentleman had a little leaking lower hole and I just excluded it, but I did put it into um, part of the dressing so he could have a smaller pouch system because if it would have done all of it, I would have had to put a big pouch on this, but using this system, you can just have a smaller pouch in place. This gentleman called this little side area of his wound his dog leg. And so we just excluded it with the products that he had at home. And so you can see we're using some uh, clear drape over the top of this with a long standing silver dressing so that it can be changed, you know, the Monday, Thursday schedule that we normally do, which got him from the, you know, the really big wound manager to the medium size, which he was so excited about. <laughs> and again, just protecting the skin that's around the fistulas. He's this young man is only 15 year old, had a fistula up here and obviously here and one underneath here. So we could exclude the areas that didn't need the pouch. I used a silver dressing in the upper area where he didn't need any fistula management and put a big pouching system on, which made him happy. He actually went to his uh, just junior prom, I think, in this um, pouch itself. So let's go to enteroatmospheric fistulas. And so 
Um, visual isolation with negative pressure in a pouch is something that we do frequently. So this lady has this cutest little fistula right here. Um, and so we're just isolating it with, this is the uh, fistula funnel. And then I'm offsetting the track pad to the side because I didn't have enough room to put the track pad really right where the fistula was. <clears throat> And then a pouch over the top, sealing that pouch again with another barrier ring. And then I do put powder in here just so the pouch doesn't stick to it. And then generally I change these dressings um, Mondays and Thursdays. Another gentleman with a uh, fistula at the lower base and then also one over here next to his belly button. And I'm putting the um, wound crown at the base and then the fistula funnel at the side just because the funnel is a little bit more flush. It does better with those uh, fistulas that have no stoma um, mucosa that you can see. And then putting pouching systems over the negative pressure system. So fistulasolution.com is a great resource for us. It, it goes through each of the different products that it owns, but it also has a lot of other knowledge. So like, let's say you went into the wound crown and you're gonna be placing that and you wanted tips and tricks. The wound crown, I'd like to put a barrier ring at the base so that when you look through it, like over here, you can see that um, the hydrocolloid comes in the middle of the wound crown. Then as the effluent comes out of the fistula, it actually grows that hydrocolloid or that barrier ring. So it's like a little turtleneck around the fistula, which helps me get a really great seal. The uh, fistula funnel, I never use a hydrocolloid. I just cut the uh, funnel on the bellows of the skirt and, and it leaves a little soft skirt because the drometer of the funnel is softer. And that is what, how I get my seal. So different techniques for different um, product lines. The isolator strip is really for that group of fistulas. And so you can put it into a ring or you can put it side to side. And here's just some little tips and tricks on how to make sure you can get a good seal with your negative pressure system. And so if you go to the Fistula Solution website, the Knowledge Center has got free information from literature to a video series that was done um, last year. All just great information for you for free. So back to our technique number four, isolation with negative pressure. So sometimes in these huge wounds, this guy just had this big uh, turkey platter type uh, wound with fistulas all around it. And so I needed something really sturdy to keep him in place. So I clear draped all around the peri fistula and peri wound skin. And then using the negative pressure system, I embedded the isolator strip so that it was super sturdy when I put the big pouching system over the top. And that really allowed him to get up and um, walk around and, and you know, do the things that he needed to do uh, with this big wound and all these fistulas. So number four, again, here is a, actually, this is an ostomy um, and we're just isolating it with the wound crown. That's how we cut it. And then if I don't have room, I just offset the track pad. Um, I like to put paste on the inside of these just initially, just to kind of get that first seal until the negative pressure system kind of takes hold. And then technique number five, which I do frequently with my surgical team, which is soft tissue removal. This makes some people nervous, but it really is a great way to handle those really difficult fistulas that are like under the edge or, um, you know, just in a place where you just can't get a pouching system on them. So I just write with a marker where I want the tissue taken off. And then you can see we're just taking down um, the area that was difficult for me to make it a nice big open area so I can use the isolation device and a vac. Really what I'm doing is preparing these patients for a skin graft. And then um, I was just teaching the residents how to put this on, so kind of step by step. I like to put a barrier ring between the wound crown and the pouching system. It just helps to prevent any small leaks. So again, soft tissue removal for this little gal. She had a fistula that was like over here. So it was like under the skin edge and just a really difficult situation to get pouched and contain. She had a lot of uh, pain with that. And so we just took down all of it so that the fistula is right in the middle. And then I can use uh, one of the isolation devices. This is the fistula funnel and vac her down, put on a pouch. And she actually healed without a skin graft and was in a standard pouching system fairly quickly. Um, another little gal, that obviously this is her ileostomy, unfortunately it's downstream. This is her little fistula, but she had these big scars and all these wrinkles just difficult to pouch um, and she was young, she wanted to go home. So we took it all down. So her fistula was right in the middle, her obviously her ileostomy is over here. 
um, and then put her in isolator strip. And she's, um, she healed so quickly. She was in the standard pouch within about a month. So then the other folks in technique six is when we do soft tissue takedown, sometimes we have to skin graft around the fistula. So that's what we're doing with this nice gentleman. He's got a fistula right down here and he was a school teacher and he needed to get back to work. So he, we always give our patient the option, be like, do you want a skin graft or would you prefer just to wait and let it heal in um, by secondary intention? And he said he'd rather get going. So we put a nice skin graft right up to the fistula in the operating room, I'm really careful to make sure that I do uh, fistula management first. So we skin graft to the fistula, I put the isolation device on and that foam goes um, separate. And then we'll have time to put the rest of the foams in and get the vac down because I have that extra set of hands that can actually manage the effluent coming out of the fistula if need be. And then the hard way I've learned is to always put on a high output pouch when you're grafting, especially in the operating room because the patient tra you know, transfers to PACU and then to the floor. A lot of times that pouch gets overfilled and then all of a sudden it starts to leak underneath on to the skin graft itself. So we changed our policy. We learned the hard way, put them into a high output pouch with the gravity drainage bag. That works just slick. Then you don't gotta worry. And what our ultimate goal is trying to get people to this point where they're, they're, the scar or the wound is healed and we can pinch the scar away from them and then we know that they're ready for that big surgical takedown. So here's another gentleman who was a motorcycle accident and he has, um, we're putting on BTM, which is a product that is a um, bio, like it's like a dermal matrix, it's synthetic. And um, you put that on first and then you skin graft them on top of this matrix. And so I'm isolating that with the funnel and offsetting the track pad. So when we take down the, the BTM, this is what it looks like. It's really graft ready. I did put him into um, installation with a uh, cleanse choice dressing just to prepare him for the skin graft. So we didn't have to use our VersaJet um, on him. And so this is what it looks like pre-graft and we're in the operating room grafting him, um, his abdomen and his ostomy as well. I did put clear drape all around this, uh, this ostomy that we grafted um, as a bolster because when he would sit, he would pull his, uh, his stoma backwards. And so I kind of using the extra big pieces of vac just to kind of hold the skin in place. And here he is, first dressing change um, after his graft, remove staples. Um, and this is what he looked like last week. He actually is going home today, which I'm very excited about. Um, and so he's just in a standard pouching system with a barrier ring and um, soft convexity and a, a pouch. And so super easy for him to do at home. And he really needed to get home. He missed his people. And then here's another little gal with a, uh, a fistula, kind of an open abdomen, kind of like the last gentleman. Her edges are rolled. I mean, she's never gonna heal this, but she's only got like 30 centimeters of bowel before the fistula and like 40 centimeters after the fistula. So we're never gonna be able to take her down because we would lose so much, um, you know, bowel trying to take down her fistula. So we're just trying to get her into a situation that she can just wear a standard pouch. And that's what we did. We did not use our, our BTM on her, and you can see that the skin graft is not quite as smooth as the last gentleman, which was a, you know, an important lesson for us as well. You know, we're always trying to learn and make our, our techniques better, but again, just trying to get her into a really easy pouching system that she can actually manage at home. This young man was hit by a train, and um, so he had a lot of injuries to his pelvis, and we just needed to get him um, with some skin coverage because his wounds were really big. So we just uh, skin grafted right up to his bowel that was kind of pulled through his wounds, um, and then just put him into a standard pouching system. They didn't want me to use any adhesive on him initially, so that's why he's in the foam dressing with the belt. And here he is, uh, skin graft healed. Okay, my last thing is a high output pouch and container. So if you have that patient that has a high outputs, doesn't chew well, so it's kind of chunky, um, this is an option. Any kind of pouching system, we just cut the bottom off and then seal it uh, around the corrugated tubing that we borrow from our respiratory department. So it's ventilator tubing, it's one inch corrugated. 
and then um, cut the top off of a 24 hour urine collection. And that is our poaching system. Well, what we learned is that if you put a suction to the upper uh, section of this container and put it to intermittent wall suction, it keeps this corrugated tube nice and empty. And then if the patients need to go down to x-ray or, you know, my patients, they always like to go outside and, you know, have some fresh air. Um, they can just take this off and we give them like a little purse and then um, they just put their suction tubing into that uh, so they can be mobile as well and it can just drain by gravity. And then I'm going to transition over to Kathy. I'm super excited to hear her presentation. Um, and this is me transitioning over to her as we are talking to the LTAC that this nice fistula patient is going to with the iPad, showing them how to do CARES prior to uh, discharge just to make sure they were comfortable with each of the steps that we gave them. So with this being said, I think I'm going to stop sharing so Kathy can take over. And I'm going to, did you get, there you go. There we go. Yay, it worked. <laughs> it's always a good thing early in the morning when things work well. So welcome very everybody. Um, I am super impressed that everybody got up this early. And then I'm also really super impressed with Marianne's presentation. I think each little fistula vignette, each little tip could probably be uh, a presentation in and of itself. So I'm really going to talk a lot about transitioning this patient. They are difficult to transition all the time. And here is our little CT information. And here are our objectives. So um, I'm really not going to address LTACs because LTACs usually have um, a great staff, a WOC nurse on staff, well-trained staff, and lots of supplies. I'm really going to talk about transitioning these people to other settings. So in uh, 2009, the Canadian Association uh, of ET Therapy or ET Nurses actually came up with this great little guideline. I want you to see what number one is. It says, perform a comprehensive nursing assessment prior to the initiation of therapy. And then, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. This thing really goes step through step about, you know, finding out what about that fistula, address those patient-centered concerns. And then it says to provide organizational support. And this was a great document. It really helped a lot of my uh, long-term care facilities to figure out and, and manage these patients. So remember, we a lot of our patients you know, may go to places that are near to our home hospitals, but we have a lot of people in the US and actually we do have uh, patients in Connecticut who are actually very, very rural. And I know that sounds kind of odd because you think of Connecticut as a more populated state, but there are lots of rural areas. And then in New England, uh, there are a lot of critical access hospitals too. So people like, you know, Marianne will take care of these patients and then they'll go three or 400 miles away. But in 2009, uh, what we saw was that the Canadians uh, actually, A, changed their name and B, came up with a new guideline. And I like this because I think they recognize some of the issues here is that, remember we said about the collaborating with leadership that was further down? Here, it's the first thing, and that's really important. And especially when you're transitioning, if you go, if you send your patient to somebody who fairly often, it's not an LTAC, either a home health or a SNF, you need to start working with that leadership as well as your own because First of all, these patients, when they transition, take lots of time. And if your uh, leadership thinks that you should be, uh, should we say, on a productivity schedule, then this is not going to work because these patients take, as you know, tremendous amounts of time. But on top of that is that the leadership in the receive agency, whether it be home health or long-term care, they need to know how much time these take and they are gonna to have to adjust the assignment and they're gonna to have to think about the budget and think about supplies. So all this is, should be done way ahead of time for your more frequent uh, agencies and facilities that you know you're gonna set a patient uh, to. Now, if they're going three or 400 miles away, it's worth making that phone call to that 
clinical supervisor, the director of nursing, and education at that place to, to come up with a, a decent plan or tell them what they're going to need. So what um, we do have that best practice recommendation, and, and I put that out here because it really tells you what you're going to need. You're going to need a comprehensive plan. You're going to need education of the staff. You're going to need the right supplies. You need to teach the patient and family because they have to often be their own advocates in these settings when things are not going right. Um, I am always concerned when I see transitions of care frameworks because there's always a section on performing and communicating a medication reconciliation. We never reconciliate our treatment plans, our wound care, our ostomy management, our incontinence management. And you know what? That's a huge disservice to our patients because a lot of times what we're finding is that people are repeating plan A, plan B, plan C, and it's already failed in another setting and it's unlikely to do well in the next setting. So to fail, you know, we've all seen this, fail to prepare is to uh, prepare to fail. And nothing is further than the truth in, in fistula management. So when you're trying to transition your patient, you really want to start way, way, way before. So what is your discharge goal? Is your goal really to uh, keep them stable for, uh, with conservative management? thinking that you know, in, a, in a year you're going to you know, repair that fistula, are you a palliative? So you have to figure that out. And then you figure out where they're going because there are actually different regulations and staff challenges in each setting. And really, you know, what resources do they have? Ideally, pre-pandemic, we would try to make a visit, physical visit to the place. And it's not only to introduce yourself, uh, the patient really likes to see that you've already been there and you can come back and report. But you know what? I like to go to the closets and I like to go to the treatment cart and I like to go into the bowels of the organization and see what they have in their, you know, in their basement for supplies. Because uh, many times you're called to try to troubleshoot something and you have to know what, know what you have to get you through. And really, I love this. The best time to make your friends is before you need them. And so if you're accepting this patient, call the WOC nurse at the sending or transferring facility and figure out what's going on. If you are the sender, again, make a friend with whoever is gonna be managing this patient. You have to identify who's gonna be the lead person on this. The nice thing about this updated version from Canada is that it's got everything there for you to help you communicate. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So you can talk about the history and you can talk about the skin. Um, I think what we're seeing here is the, the lack of how do I do this? You know, where do I start and where do I go? So you really want to establish that contact person, get a name, get a phone number, get an email, get a cell phone, and find out which way they want to be contacted at. I always, 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 always let my reps know, hey, I'm transferring this really complicated patient. Um, and then they may want to come in and help refresh staff education. Uh, they may be your best friend when somebody has run out of supplies on a Saturday night at 3 a.m. Um, and so we can, you know, Sunday morning we're up and, and making a lot of phone calls and getting supplies to the patient. And then, of course, as Miriam has talked about earlier uh, yesterday um, about that staff framework. We've got to get that going and how our interventions uh, will play out. So, uh, I'd like to be very concrete. Um, we have to remember that many, many times in long-term care or in home health, the nurses are actually you know, great generalists. They have to know a lot from A to Z, but they don't know the minutia. And so we may have to remind them about you know, what our, our goals are for this patient. And most of it is supportive uh, in these areas. And uh, our really underlying priority of care in these settings is to prevent the perifistula skin 
from breaking down because once that's a problem, it is a huge problem to try to restore and then manage everything else. And then we have to remind them about nutrition and um, why you want to quantify the output and then pain medicine. We're going to actually talk about pain management in a little bit. I think the biggest thing that we find uh, from most of the agency and long-term care facilities is the cost because they uh, usually they are under a payment system called either PDGM or PDPM and they're essentially getting a, a DRG and uh, it's very difficult when you have all these supplies to uh, manage when you're managing poorly. So it's really important to tell them, you know what, this may look like it's uh, is very involved and it costs a lot of money, but it doesn't because you're gonna, if you don't manage it properly, you're gonna spend three times, four times as much. So when we're thinking about conservative treatment, we have to remind the nursing staff about uh, all the things that we really wanna do is, you know, we wanna control the fistula drainage because that's what they're really gonna be focusing on. And they're not necessarily be very cognizant about hydration. So the patient's starting to get a little loggy, a little lethargic, you know, we may want to make sure they call the provider and get some blood work ordered. And you have to remember that at least in long-term care, most people don't have point of care lab work. Um, so you would have to do a stat lab. So they'll come in two to four hours, maybe. And then by the time it gets back to the uh, lab and then run, it may be six or eight hours. So you're way, way behind and that's a stat. So you, you really kind of have to keep ahead of these people. And really our goal here is to improve their function because they've lost a lot of function being in the acute care setting. And our goal is to get them as functional as possible and both physically, but also mentally. These people have been through a, a lot. So uh, we do want to, again, follow that framework for SNAP, and we have to assess that skill level of the staff. I had to laugh because I was um, listening to a surgeon talk about how to manage fistulas, and he was saying that uh, we should only have a senior person, one or two senior people, take care of this fistula, uh, and, and I just was thinking, you know what, in long-term care, the senior person probably graduated nursing school one month ago. And so there is um, very, it's very difficult. In fact, the more people you have, and especially involving the CNAs, is just, um, just so, so important. We also have to know and identify what those red flags are for that patient because if, they're, if they are not used to seeing a patient with a fistula or managing fistula, they may not know what, a, what red, red flag we should be looking at. And then we need, again, to work with leadership to make sure we have those supplies. It's really great if you can get staff consistency, but you can't necessarily um, count on it. So with that, what you need is an availability of a knowledgeable provider 24 seven. So it, a lot of times you're in home health, you end up calling the primary care physician if you can get through, or maybe there's somebody uh, covering who doesn't really know anything. Um, in long-term care, they're gonna end up calling the nurse practitioner or PA who's on call, who will then call the physician. So, and those people, again, aren't gonna know a whole lot. So make sure you have a schedule. I mean, we all need time off, right? But you need to have a schedule so you can have somebody that the staff can access if there's a problem. So really what we're thinking of here is, um, you know, uh, do we, you know, pouch or do we use negative pressure? So uh, essentially the goal here is we wanna prevent dressing changes that are very often. We wanna make sure they're not painful because when uh, our skin goes down, then we ex exhaust the patient, we exhaust the nurse and we exhaust the budget. So our traditional thoughts here, you know, is that if we would patch with containment um, and uh, low output with patching and dressings, but in a post-acute, um, the reality is, is that when somebody sees something high, high output, it's um, towels. You know? And maybe I'll throw a brief over there too. Uh, and then uh, moderate output, there'll be ABDs plus or minus towels. 
And then low output, my favorite, is that people will just use um, pink tape <clears throat> to cover the leakage until the next shift, shift comes in. And they will can, that shift will do the same thing. They just make it lower and lower and lower. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is the reality <clears throat> that we see in uh, long-term care and very frequently a lot at home health only because the family doesn't know what to do or the patient doesn't know what to do or most likely they don't want to bother the nurse at all. So this is a, a patient that had a low output fistula and this is where we actually use telehealth a lot. Uh, they don't really need a lot. Once you have set up a decent plan, they don't need a um, tremendous amount of, of intervention. Uh, this patient obviously had just some you know, mild irritant dermatitis around her uh, area. And the thing is, she refused to be pouched. She did not want to pouch. She already had a diverting colostomy. So she thought the more bags, the worse she was going to be. So essentially, this was just managed with ABDs at the patient's request. And remember, if you, you can talk to them to, the blue, to your blue in the face, but when your patient has decided how they want to manage their care, you really have to support them. So all we did essentially is um, use a, 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 the Cavalon um, Advanced to keep the skin intact. And she was able to change her own EBD pads, and she did it six, seven, eight, ten times a day sometimes, um, because the minute there was a, a little smidge of drainage on there, she would go ahead and change it. So <clears throat> we have to make sure that people have skin protectants and barrier films uh, readily accessible to their uh, armamentarium, so to speak. <clears throat> and I think we want the data about, you know, how long does it last? Because some facilities will, will uh, have, not some, all facilities will have a formulary, right? And so every formulary has a skin protectant on it. And when it does, it may not be something that lasts very long. And when that's the case, you end up changing things more frequently. And then if you have skin damage, you end up doing, having this vicious cycle, right? So, you know, I, I like to use this, um, from Mary Matheson because when I go to a leadership person at my receiving facility and I'll say, you know, you really need to buy the Cavalon because, and here's the data, you're going to actually use less and you're going to save on your supplies. So a, um, a post-acute challenge here that I find frequently problematic is getting a registered dietitian. Now it's not so bad in skilled nursing facility, but in uh, home health, it can be uh, problematic. The problem with both of these agencies is that these are usually contracted positions or part-time positions. They don't really produce a whole lot of revenue and they're almost viewed as value added. And so, or regulatory in long-term care, it's uh, regulated that they're there. But, so you, you're, you're going to get a registered dietitian, but it's not going to be as frequent as you want. And the problem is, is that most likely they have been in this type of setting for such a long time, they don't have that expertise in managing a fistula um, or doing fistula crisis. So here is where what we do is connect. So you call your dietitian at your acute care facility and say, hey, you know, I have this dietitian. She doesn't do this, or he doesn't do this, hasn't done it at all, rarely does this. Can I have them call you? And then you just make the connection. And then they take it from there, and it's really a godsend. So our role as WC nurses is doing a lot of these connections. Now, um, a lot of times what we're trying to do here is improve our patient's physical function, right? And when, they, when this happens, you see a lot of... Uh, loss of pouch integrity. And I think Marianne covered that really well by using the you know, large drapes, and that really, really helps. But um, there may be some relationship with uh, their dietary intake and, so, um, and with the therapy that they're getting. So maybe the therapist is, you know, and I'm just making an example here, having them do abdominal crunches, right? Uh, unlikely, but that's an extreme example. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna discuss with therapy, what's, what's, what are they doing? Um, is that contributing to the integrity loss of your dressing? 
And then you have to go back to the, the drawing board. <clears throat> and maybe they do therapy really early in the morning before there's uh, food intake, or maybe we shut the, the feedings off prior to that. Um, the other issue is uh, that I see frequently is physical therapy may disconnect them from their negative pressure unit and nobody plugs it back in and people forget to recharge things. So the other issue is clearly medical device related pressure injuries from the tubing. And I know this picture is not a picture of a uh, fistula, but we uh, actually kind of make little troughs in our black foam and our uh, tubing actually can sit in that little trough. And so when they're going to therapy, we can just um, secure things. Uh, if we have people who have things on their belly or big, huge crease, we can actually put the, the tubing into our little trough and then into the crease and prevent uh, additional issues. Uh, here we have people with low output fistulas. We have, I think we forget we have uh, the SNAP and that is a, a way to actually manage these low output fistulas really, really well and allow a lot of physical function. Uh, we do have lots of challenges teaching the staff. And again, we would like, you know, using our iPad, we usually would um, record things uh, on Zoom and let them have access to it. Marianne shared some other great places to get some resources. But again, you have to identify your caregivers and uh, get a lot of buy-in. Uh, we usually do a, a weekly case review, do a Zoom meeting or whatever uh, HIPAA compliant uh, platform you might have to get the whole team together. You just schedule the meeting because you have to figure out what the problems are. And we also have to have a process to access the surgeon and the attending on a more urgent basis if something goes bad. So um, I usually like to, if I can, uh, run a workshop um, demonstration, return demonstration uh, for, for people so they're more comfortable because there's nothing that scares a patient more than anything uh, is A, um, they don't know what they're doing. And so having those pictures like Marianne had about setting up all the supplies ahead of time so they can actually do this and go, go into the room looking at least like they know what they're doing. We like to provide a recipe and actually, again, that Canadian document actually has this uh, recipe for uh, managing patients. And it really, it's so great. I mean, literally identify the patient using a two unique identifiers or according to facility protocol. There's like nothing, stone, no stone is left unturned here. And in the back of this document, again, has the step-by-step um, -step procedure on how to use your uh, wound crown or your isolator strips or your fistula funnel. A really great uh, thing for you also to use when you're transferring or transitioning your patient. You can actually photocopy this or um, download it and, and send it with them. Um, I also like to take pictures of what things should look like when you're taking things down. And this is a, an example of that. And feedback. So if you end up seeing a problem, you, you, you have to kind of address it sooner rather than later. This is somebody that had um, part of the uh, trackpad a little bit off the phone, and so we ended up getting a blister. And so it means going back and giving feedback again, identifying who that person is in the facility who's going to be your lead person, plus the person that may have um, uh, placed this on. Uh, we do need to teach red flags, and this is a great red flag that you would certainly want to teach. Um, bleeding is possible with any uh, type of negative pressure, and it doesn't matter what brand it is, sometimes bad things happen. Um, sometimes we actually find that the attending does not appreciate anticoagulation uh, enough, or, or maybe too much, and so they will start anticoagulation and not let anybody else know. Um, and the nursing staff haven't put two and two together until they walk in the room and see this. Um, I like to have uh, print these red flags, put them uh, in, in the patients. Um, they have in long-term care, they have these little HIPAA folders. So I like to put them in there, put them in the MedCardX, keep them with the supplies so people can uh, 
access them. And also, this is a great thing to send home with your patient if they're having a problem. Uh, I also like to have a red flag for uh, your inventory. So if you have anything that's, you're, you don't have three days or less of supplies, you better um, watch out. And then the other thing we need to look out is for the three day weekend holiday. And uh, I'm saying this now because Christmas is on a Friday, which means the last orders will be Wednesday because nothing is gonna happen on Christmas Eve. So if you haven't planned for five days, ahead, you're going to have bigger problems when you get back on that Monday after that holiday weekend. Um, clearly, um, what we need to do is teach both the family and the patient and the nursing staff because they actually help each other keep uh, on the straight and narrow. So let's talk a little bit about those anti-mobility motility medications that we see um, frequently used. So, and this is the, the essentially the algorithm that people use it is a little bit more difficult to uh, get the uh, low modal, and that's because it's considered a narcotic. And in long-term care, it's uh, more difficult. So when we get um, decoding and then opium, and I know Marianne loves opium, I love opium, it is like awesome stuff, right? Uh, but the SNFs are usually given a 30-day supply of meds, and also if you're home, unless you're writing the prescription for seven days or 15 days or 30 days, you're, you're going to get uh, a, the amount that you have ordered, and that's it. So it means you'll be actually making a lot of phone calls or calling in scripts on uh, days that you really are thinking that you'd like to do something else. Uh, we do want to make sure the nursing staff does this, or the patient does this before meals. Um, a lot of these places actually have preset times. So, and it's usually a one, four. So it may be fall before a meal and it may not. So you have to be a little bit of a detective and figure out when sh these really should be given and then alter the, the specified your time. So again, we talked about low modal being a uh, scheduled five. So you're going to need to sign prescription. And so you're going to have to have that system in place. So especially in long-term care, because it has to be faxed over to the um, facility or to the pharmacy. So the question is, is that that means you need to have communication with the attending. And a lot will depend on your state regs. Many state regs require that the uh, that the attending do this and not a consulting person. Uh, and when it comes to opium in a long-term care facility, it's really, 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 really hard to get. A lot of pharmacies don't carry it. Um, the patient, um, if they're home, you have to make sure they can medicate themselves correctly. And what we wanna do is get ready to get questioned by pharmacy. In fact, um, my ex-daughter-in-law is a DEA agent and she says, when the word opium comes, comes across, then there is like a beeline to figure out why this prescriber is ordering opium. So just be ready to be questioned because um, when that happens. Also, we have to let the uh, dietitian and the nursing staff know that this, these are medicines not because of necessarily for pain, but for motility. Otherwise, they, they, these patients get uh, labeled as addicts. Um, again, an important thing here is having a psych liaison nurse, and they do wonderful things for these patients. Don't forget to get somebody involved. A lot of long-term care facilities will have a psych person on board. You're going to probably have to want to interview these people because there are some who are there just to do meds and some who are actually there to discuss things with the patient. So the patient, um, and if you can't find somebody, ask your acute care facility if your psych uh, CNS would be willing to do a telemedicine visit because there are lots of concerns and I think we're all aware of what they are. But we also have to think about the staff because they are going crazy too. These patients take a lot of time. There's a lot of cost involved. Uh, there is a lot of avoidance and then people do workarounds. And here's a great idea of a workaround. So the nurse was spending too much time um, taking care of this patient. So she decided that she would just uh, take negative pressure and throw it right in 
to the fistula. So probably not a good idea. So we have to spend um, some time to, um, talking about why people uh, did that. And a lot of it is from frustration. So when you have leakage, it's a lot of detective work. So it's trial, error, analysis, and repeat. And this is where you really want to spend time with your staff, either using telemedicine or an on-site visit. Your patient loves you if you do show up. Your patient loves it when you show up on, on their iPad because it's a familiar face. So uh, we all know what this is not good. And um, this is what she looked at like after day 10. And we suspected that there was a fistula there. And um, clearly by day 21, we were able to see it's, it's by nine o'clock and it kind of tucked its way under there. Um, day 50, so actually we, you know, isolated our fistula, our um, mesh is granulated over, and this is essentially just plain old management. But the question is, is that uh, we're in long-term long care at this point. And so things uh, were going fairly well and with a lot of intensive management by uh, the acute care staff. And um, we brought her back. We, on day 90, we were able to do a skin graft and things are looking pretty good here. This is our first uh, post-op change, but you know, um, things are not going as well. And you can see here, our graft is not as healthy as it should have been. And it's clearly um, the reason why is because essentially we let up on the gas and we thought the nursing staff had managed things really, really well up to a point. And now we're finding just by looking at this that the, they are not containing the effluent as well as they should. And our investigation, we found out that we really were having um, issues with um, uh, new staff. So people may use baby nipples, uh, convex rings. You're gonna have to have a backup system until some supplies arrive. Unfortunately, um, people will use things improperly, and this is the baby nipple straight to without any um, barriers or um, uh, rings or uh, anything else, and we got into the skin. Fortunately, uh, we were able to reverse that, and you can see over on the right-hand side. Um, management tip here. So most long-term care facilities will have one type of ostomy, uh, management system. And it could be either one piece or a two piece, but that's it. So if their one piece or two piece doesn't fit, um, a lot of these places do have external fecal management pouches, which serve as a great alternative. And then um, another thing that you do have to remember is that if they are using a pouch with a filter, they are going to want to cover that up. And you want to leave that green stripe there to remind people to cover it up because then you're not going to get the suction that you need. Um, this is a, a great case and I'm going to finish up very brief or quickly on this. Uh, um, I got a call from the surgeon saying, hey, you know, I just saw so-and-so, um, you know, there's a very low output fistula. Um, the patient's uh, at such and such facility, can you go um, over there? And this was a Friday, of course, at four. Uh, can you go over there on Monday? Yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. You know, the nursing staff can handle it till then. Well, um, you know, if you look on day seven, they aren't handling it. They, well, they are handling it because they're just putting ABDs uh, and towels on. So we ended up um, using a Cavalon advanced skin protectant. We used, um, started uh, negative pressure. And this man had lots of pain, so we used the Dermatac drape. And if you haven't had an opportunity to explore that, go to the booth. It is the most awesome thing in the entire world. So day 12, uh, we actually could see that we're having um, two fistulas there. And um, we got rid of some of that dead stuff. And day 18, we're coming along really well. We were able to isolate everything. And day 50, we continued. And by day 75, we just had a really, really small thing. Uh, we were able, uh, his, his, he was actually high output, but um, he actually started to reduce. And so we were able to just do uh, routine pouching and off he went home. And he went home with great function and um, did really, really well. So with that, I wanna thank you so much. I wanna thank all of you for getting up. Marianne, I think your presentation was awesome. Um, I'm going to turn this actually over to Sandra because we have some time for questions. Thank you.
Great. Yes. Let's go right into questions. And, you know, we've had some nice feedback from everyone. If you want to pull up your Q&A, um, that way we can follow along here. But you did cover a lot of great practical information. And I agree with Mary Applegate's comment, you know, that this is information that they can go and apply right now. Um, but I think that there's also a, a need to, to understand and just to expand on this topic. Um, and, and Kathy, you, you touched on how to build this network of, of resources and how important that is. Um, can you provide some tips as to how they can initiate that conversation? How can someone in the out-of-hospital space work with the healthcare team to help reinforce and build that network that they, that they need to, to rely on? So one of the things I think uh, that's so important about having regional uh, um, conferences and regional groups is because you can get together. And now that we have, are also comfortable with technology is to reach out. Um, we also can make, you know, simple phone calls, but reaching out and saying and running workshops way ahead of time really can be helpful. Um, and also we really rely on our industry partners to help us because they too know who is doing what and where. And so if they can host uh, demonstration and, and training programs. Uh, it's really, really helpful. Marianne, do you have any input? No, I mean, I, I definitely keep in contact with all my patients. Um, we are like an 18 month to cure program. So we do the same thing that Kathy does. I make calls, I do site visits. Um, I give my patients ways to contact me either via email or text message because they are so complicated. And Kathy is so right that sometimes it's just a phone call to the facility to just kind of talk them through what to do. And, and then they succeed and it's, it's awesome. And you know, before the pandemic, we did for sure a lot of bringing in people to teach at the bedside before they ever even transferred to that facility. And it's been a little bit more tricky, but we definitely are doing a lot of the iPad telehealth stuff which is, you know, it's fun. You get to see everybody and they can kind of see what we're doing. Um, so I, we do much of the same. And we do do as a trauma center, I mean, there's a lot of um, foundation work where we're giving out free supplies because these facilities just cannot afford to supply these patients with these expensive products. Um, but it's better for the patient to be in the facility. And so our regions, our, our hospital's foundation many times will just gift uh, pouches or whatever they need to, to keep them in at home or in, the, in a facility. And, and Mary, and I think you make a really good point is that, uh, you know, we, you have to work with your leadership ahead of time. There are a lot of places that don't want you to give supplies to anybody. And so um, I always approach it as, you know, this patient's going to be re-hospitalized if we don't do this. And so it's a little bit um, more cost effective to do this now. Also, it helps improve your patient satisfaction scores. And so those are some of the things that the C-suite people really want to hear. And it's really the right thing for the patient too. Great. Kathy, uh, so you also spoke about um, the importance of teaching the, the red flags. Um, where can they go to access the very nice checklist that you showed um, even your inventory checklists or some of those resources? Um, you can email me and um, also the, the Canadian um, document has um, a checklist also. Great. Uh, Marianne, some more technical question for you. Um, do you have a preference of using the two inch barrier ring or a four inch barrier ring for the larger area fistulas? When are you prepping for pouching the fistula? Yeah, I'm a four inch uh, junkie for that, the uh, barrier rings. The, the two inch barrier rings are a little bit too fat for me. And so I like the four inch because they're thinner and they just go further because I cut them in circles and, you know, we're always trying to save money, but so I'm, I love the four inch flat. <laughs> I carry them in my pockets everywhere I go. <laughs> um, Kelly asks, I noticed the isolation technique number four, there were multiple fistulas, but there was only one isolated. Were you using NPWT to close the others? 
Um, I'm not, I can't remember for sure which one that is, but I think that he, I think it was the gentleman that had a group of fistulas. And then after we do our anatomy check, they were actually distal. And so I was actually covering them with like a couple layers of zero form. So I, I wasn't trying to close them. We were just trying to um, isolate the high output fistulas and then manage and contract the wound. And so I, if I remember right, I think I put a couple layers of zero form over them and then I put the negative pressure on top of them because they were, you know, downstream from um, where the high output fistula was. I hope that answers your question, Kelly. Otherwise, email me. <laughs> <laughs> And I think we just have time for one more question before we wrap up. We're already at the top of the hour. Um, so the question is around the use of negative pressure. When you use the negative pressure as a bolster, does insurance cover that if you are not using it on a wound site? So the answer is no. Um, the, the reason I have the luxury of doing so is because I'm inpatient. And so I don't actually need to, you know, have, we have the luxury of using the products anywhere we want. Generally speaking, we do have, you know, an incision or a wound around, but when we're doing it in surgery as a bolster to um, a closed incision or after a big abdominal wall reconstruction, we always transition them to like a, a standard incisional vac before they go home. But we have the luxury of doing, you know, what we want inside the facility, which is, you know, really great for us, but I totally understand that it can be super frustrating post-acute. Awesome. So I know that we had a lot of technical pearls and best practices that were covered today. So if there are, if there's any part of the talk that you would like to watch again, I think this presentation is going to be recorded and is going to be able to be accessed for the next couple of weeks. So that's very good to know. I know there were still some remaining questions on. Um, so I just would like to close at this point, you know, on behalf of 3M and KCI, I want to thank you all for attending and we hope that you enjoyed these two great presentations. I want to invite you to visit the 3M and KCI virtual booth and there when you attend uh, you can always chat with a 3M representative if you have any other remaining questions at all. Um, any session related questions that are fielded to our 3M representatives we can certainly send over to Mary Ann and to Kathy to address directly with you afterward. So um, yes I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day and I thank you all again for participating. Have a good day. Bye everybody. Bye.